My name is Tracy Bernard. Uh, my name is Tracy Bernard. I'm currently in South Africa in KwaZulu Natal. I'm very excited to have the opportunity to present a topic to you guys today. And uh, my topic that I'm doing is managing stress and burnout as an individual and the team. I'm specifically looking at the emergency nurses working in the emergency department. I think it's a, it's a topic I can closely relate to from when I was working in the hospitals. Now I'm currently moved over to education and I work for a private nursing education institute. I'm a postgraduate lecturer for the emergency nurses. And I see this a lot in my students when we have our conversations. Very often they mention the, the stress and the, the burnout that they experience. Okay. Um, so I'd like to generally start off my topics looking um, at definitions. I think definitions puts everybody on the same page because we all do have our own perceptions or ideas of certain words. So we're going to just very briefly look at what is stress, what is burnout, and then we're going to look at all the possible causes of what's causing the burnout in the emergency departments or even in the hospitals. And then what are the implications of burnout? How do we identify burnout in ourselves and in our colleagues? Because this is not just about us, it's about me and it's about the team as well. And then going forward, how can we better manage the burnout? Yeah, what is stress? Uh, this is a definition that I've got off the World Health Organization site where they describe stress as a state of worry or mental tension that is caused by a difficult situation. And on a daily basis, we can be faced with difficult situations, whether it's within ourselves, we have a difficult task to complete, or whether it's the way the patient presents that we're not quite familiar with, or it could be a difficult relative, for example. A nature, an, uh, sorry, a natural human response that prompts us to address challenges and threats in our daily lives. And you might be surprised to know that stress is actually good for us. Stress is what makes us grow and develop um, to be better people um, than we, we are today or yesterday. Okay, but the problem is that too much stress or unhealthy levels of stress is going to lead to burnout. So what is burnout? I'm just trying to change my slide. My arrows are gone. There we go. Okay, burnout was first identified in 1974 by this guy named Frudenberger. And he observed a loss of motivation and a reduced commitment amongst volunteers in a health clinic. So it's quite surprising to know that the term burnout has only been around for not even 50 years. Otherwise burnout, it's known as a mental, physical, emotional fatigue that is caused by the sustained work-related stresses. And we're going to talk about the various causes. So we're going to hear about how the long hours and the pressure of quick decision making will then cause a strain, as well as the caring for patients who have very poor outcomes because they're critically ill or injured. The World Health Organization also offers a definition for burnout, and then they closely refer to it as an occupational phenomenon that is very often caused by unrealistic expectations. And that could be expectations that we place upon ourselves, expectations that we place upon our colleagues, or even expectations that our managers place upon us. And together, this just becomes the conundrum of together with lack of sleep and other work-related stresses. As you face many stressful situations, you start to begin to feel uh, disengaged or detached. And this is very often the first warning sign of burnout. And when you don't address the burnout, it then leads to these feelings of helplessness and then even depression. 
Okay, some of the causes of burnout, in particular, it's working long shifts. So burnout is two and a half times more common in nurses who are working shifts greater than 10 hours. So nurses who are working the 12 hour shifts, especially back to back or several days in a row, very often lack sleep as well because of the consecutive days on duty. In the emergency department in particular, you have to deal with combative patients, traumatic injuries, ethical dilemmas, and a high mortality rate. All of these are linked to high stress levels, placing you at a risk of burnout. In addition, if the workplace lacks a culture of good teamwork and collaboration, you then become more at risk of developing burnout. So you'll find that poor teamwork, which can either involve maybe conflict with a colleague or another member of the multidisciplinary team, uh, poor communication, a lack of cooperation amongst your colleagues, and even peer bullying, which is evidence um, in our institutes. Other sources uh, of, of stress could include um, violence and aggression from patients, or even witnessing or participating in a recess with poor outcomes and, and managing um, critically ill and injured patients. Some implications of burnout. So nurse burnout is substantial concern for all. It, it affects the nurse, it affects the institute or the employers, and then it affects the patients. Nurses in particular are at risk for developing depression in themselves and even other mental health conditions. And then they are at risk of quitting their jobs. Quitting their jobs is gonna place, place further stress on them from a financial perspective as well. For the institutes, nurse burnout leads to a decrease in the quality of patient care, and then it can affect the reputation of the hospitals. You'll see here in a study done by the International Journal of Environmental Research and Public Health, these researchers found a correlation between high rates of burnout syndrome in nurses and their intention to leave the organization. The increase in turnover will put more stress on an already environment. For patients, nurse burnout directly impacts on the quality of the care they receive. The most dangerous risk associated with burnout is a decrease in the quality of care, and then there is a threat to the patient safety. Mistakes often happen when nurses become exhausted, and this leads to patients' infection rates increasing, and even in extreme cases, there could be patient deaths. So while we talk about nurse burnout, I think it's particularly interesting to look at numbers. So if we have to quantify how burnt out are nurses, um, I've considered this article labeled the relationship between burnout and job satisfaction amongst registered nurses at an academic hospital in Johannesburg. And this study included 165 registered nurses. And what's particularly important for me to point out is that they've used the MASLAC burnout inventory tool to measure the nurses' burnout. And other literature tells us that the MASLAC burnout inventory tool is actually the gold standard for measuring burnout. It measures burnout on three levels. So looking at the first level being emotional exhaustion. The second level is depersonalization. And then the third level is personal accomplishment. So in this research study, it's revealed that the 165 registered nurses had an emotional exhaustion score of 75.8%. And then this was followed by um, depersonalization at 71.5%. So these are pretty high scores. Uh, however, the personal accomplishment was reported at 77%. So while there was an inverse relationship between job satisfaction and the first two levels 
being emotional exhaustion and depersonalization, the nurses still had retained their sense of personal accomplishment. Okay, and that uh, can be related to uh, compassion, satisfaction, and resilience of the nurses. So when one looks at this article, you might say, oh, but this was one hospital and your sample is really small. It's 165 nurses. So I then went on to search for other articles that would include a bigger sample or more hospitals. And here we have an article uh, uh, labeled a tale of two systems, nurse practice environment, well-being, perceived quality of care, and patient safety in private and public hospitals in South Africa. So this was a cross-sectional study done over 62 hospitals, looking at the nine provinces that we have here in South Africa, um, namely the Gauteng, Northwest, Free State, Eastern Cape, Western Cape, and KwaZulu-Natal. And then in addition to that, this study actually included hospitals from both the public sector and the private sector. So this was really nice to look at burnout levels across more than one hospital and then in, in various sectors. So this study included 1,187 nurses and nationally overall we can see that burnout scores are 45.8%. So as much as it wasn't as high as the previous That's article, amazing. it's definitely significant if we're going to say one in two nurses are experiencing burnout. When we further look at private versus public sectors, we can see in the private sector, 40.6% nurses experience burnout. And in the public sector, it's much more increased. It's 53.8%. Okay, and then that would go along with uh, just the socioeconomic uh, demographic of, of South Africa, which might be um, possibly similar or different from the other countries in the world. Then I began to think, okay, so where does burnout really start? And if we think about when nurses first enter into the hospital setting and encounter these various stresses that they are going to encounter, it happens when they are a student because they have to accumulate clinical hours during their training. So then I thought it would be particularly interesting to look at what is the burnout scores of students? And here we have this article labeled Compassion Fatigue, Burnout and Compassion Satisfaction, the Prevalence Amongst Nursing Students. And this study looked at students in a particular university. What were the burnout scores in their first year, second year, and third year of nursing? And we can see that in the first year, the burnout scores for the high risk is only 1%. So that's a huge difference from the previous two articles that we've considered. And then when you compare the first year students to the second year students, in the second year, the burnout scores had increased to 3%. So this is an indication that when the nurses enter the clinical environment and they're exposed to the various stresses, over a period of one year, we've gone from 1% to 3%. And then further, in the third year nursing students, their burnout scores were sitting at 6%. Okay, so it's almost doubled from second year to third year. Um, so we can see that the, the longer the exposure to the clinical environment and your exposure to the various stresses, it's going to increase burnout. How to identify burnout? So sometimes burnout creeps up on us and we're not able to pick it up immediately. So little signs that you're becoming burnout would be, for example, that you can't have a work-life balance or you are struggling to maintain your work-life balance. You're almost calling it a work-work balance because when you are off duty, you are thinking about the things that were either happening at work or that you need to do when you get back to work. 
And very often we don't realize that we are burnt out and it's our colleagues that will pick it up to say that you are just not looking um, the same. Signs of burnout can be differentiated between mental, physical, and emotional. So looking at mental signs of burnout would be an individual who is lacking interest or motivation as much as they used to. They are becoming more forgetful or expressing hopelessness. And then you'll also find procrastination. Some physical signs of burnout would be inconsistent sleeping patterns. So you're not sleeping normally. You're feeling exhausted. You're having appetite changes and frequent health problems, such as your blood pressure or your, your sugar levels are no more within the normal range. Emotional signs of burnout can include anxiety or depression. Um, you're becoming increasingly irritable or you anger easily. And um, any cynicism, fe feelings of cynicism. So um, cynicism is a belief that people are motivated by self-interest. So you begin to distrust or mistrust your colleagues thinking they have ulterior motives. Uh, and it's not necessarily that way. And then chronic stress. Uh, other signs of behavior that's not listed over here that you would consider warning signs for burnout would be if a person becomes withdrawn or they prefer to isolate themselves. If you find that yourself or your colleagues are making poor judgment calls, easily frustrated, and then it's, it's unfortunate that some nurses they will try to manage their stress using unhealthy coping mechanisms. So they might turn to substance abuse. Better ways to manage burnout, um, <laughs> because we cannot really control the stresses, they are external. So what we can do for ourselves is that we have to practice self-care. So self-care self is a skill that many nurses neglect. <laughs> it's a set of activities that you would then engage in on a regular basis to help you decrease your stress levels. You have to be able to take care of yourself in order to do your job effectively and be the best nurse you can be to your patients. The World Health Organization defines self-care as the ability of individuals and families, communities to be able to promote health, prevent disease, maintain health, and cope with any illness or disability with or without the support of healthcare providers. Self-care for nurses uh, even falls under the same definition and is demonstrated where nurses will then implement intentional efforts to achieve, promote, maintain their own physical, mental, and emotional health. There are also other countries that have regulations that would then mandate for nurses to take care of themselves. And an example of that is the American Nurses Association. They have a code of ethics that actually mandates for nurses to practice self-care. The uh, ANA code states that the moral respect that nurses extend to all people should be extended to oneself as well. So the same duties that we owe others, which would be our patients, we owe to ourselves. So this responsibility that is outlined in the Code of Ethics includes promoting the health, safety, maintaining competence, and preserving your own character and integrity and continuing personal and professional growth. That's not something you can do if you are feeling burnt out drained and you are having negative feelings. When I look at my own country in South Africa, our South African Nursing Council reg has a regulation 2127, which is our scope of professional nursing. 
And within our scope of professional nursing, it tells us the professional nurse takes responsibility and accountability for, and then it lists, and I just want to read a few things off that list, ensuring safe implementation of nursing care, the execution of treatment, and the managing and coordinating of nursing care effectively within the health establishment. How do we do that if we are drained and burnt out and frustrated and making mistakes? We have to take care of ourselves before we are able to take care of others. Um, and I would just like to encourage you uh, to, if you are in uh, your country and in your nursing institute, to go and look at what are the policies or the regulations that are there that is going to aim to ensure that nurses are encouraged to take care of themselves through self-care. Self-care is important for nurses. From the top of the list, we know that self-care is going to be one of our stress management tools. It's going to help us to better cope with the stresses that we're going to face on a daily basis. It ensures that our compassion and empathy is replenished. Those are the things that we need when we look after our patients. Self-care is going to ensure that we promote safety in the workplace. It ensures that we deliver a higher quality of care to patients. It's going to decrease the occurrence of depression in the nurses. It's going to ensure better sleep and improved energy levels. It also encourages nurses to live healthier lifestyles, which means there is going to be a decrease in health-related problems. Yeah, there's various ways that we can practice self-care. Um, we can look at mental aspects, physical aspects, emotional, spiritual, social, personal aspects of self-care. And it's important to know that every person is an individual and those self-care um, activities or mechanisms or tips that work for me is not going to be the same that work for you. And sometimes we are so unique as individuals is that some people don't need mental self-care, but they do need social self-care. So while we go through each of these aspects, just try to pick out what's going to work for you. Not everything um, is, is for everybody. If we look at mental self-care, it's about helping nurses develop intellectually taking time out to expand knowledge or gain knowledge helps you to gain insight into the things and it can really strengthen and build your confidence. Mental self-care, it's about paying attention to the people and the things that are within your personal space and that you can control. Remember, you don't want to direct your energy to stresses that are out of your control. So mental self-care, it's really beneficial um, for nurses. It gives them an opportunity to reflect on what's really important to them and to spend time on what's important to a person rather than what's not will make you feel a lot less frustrated. So these are just some ideas on activities you can practice for, for mental self-care. Some of these activities you do as an individual and some of them you can do along with your colleagues. What's really important about self-care is don't think of it as this big task where you now have to set aside two hours to heal yourself. You have to find ways to to include self-care in your daily activities. Um, so some of them are really short and some of them are a bit long. So for example, completing a course it might be a one-day course such as basic life support. It might be a six-month course such as a certificate program, or then it could be a one-year course such as a diploma in, in a program. Engaging in a committee is also a great way to build mental self-care or even taking time to read a journal article um, before work or during a tea break. 
engaging with your colleagues to teach a new nurse uh, a skill or something in the department is also quite useful and it's going to build relationships amongst the team. At home, you can piece together a puzzle, play a game, whether it's by yourself, or with your family, you can read a book or even do a journal entry. Physical self-care. While nursing is often seen as a physical career because we are always on our feet, it doesn't necessarily count as a physical activity. You need strength activities that are going to work more major muscle groups. So physical self-care also includes taking care of your body's needs. Sleep is very important to include, as well as the paying attention to the type of food you eat. They all impact on your physical well-being. Exercise in particular will stimulate the release of endorphins, which is also known as the body's happy hormones. And then this will trigger an elevated mood and reduce your stress levels. Healthy diets that include fruits, vegetables, and proteins all help to stabilize your blood sugar levels. And it also improves your mood stability. When you are at work, you can consider parking a bit further away from the building and taking a, a bit of a walk. Or if you do have various levels within your hospital institute, use the stairs instead of the elevator. So you can see there are little ways within your work day to increase your physical self-care. You can make healthy food choices. So rather pack your lunch, making sure that you have a variety of snacks rather than ordering from the cafeteria, for example. When you're at home, you can find exercises that you enjoy. Join a social club that walks, runs, or cycles. Whatever you like to do. If you're not a person who likes to cycle or run, you can find a walking club. With your family, have dance parties on one of the evenings, okay? And then make sure that you do go to bed early enough for a good night's rest. Emotional self-care. Nursing can be really hard on your emotions. And while you often might feel the highs of helping your patients, there are also the lows of seeing patients with conditions that will just deteriorate despite your best efforts. It's important to make sure that you have an outlet to express these difficult emotions and also boost your own mood. At work, it's important to have conversations that include humor. Don't forget to praise each other for the good work and accomplishments throughout the day. Even smiling at somebody you walk past, they will smile back at you. At home, you can look forward to spending time with your loved ones. And then even just take a moment every morning when you're in the bathroom, just to look in front of the mirror, look at yourself and say words of affirmation. You can even print them and cut them out, stick them up next to the mirror and just every day say, I am enough. I believe in me. I am on my side. I take care of myself. And while on the first day, you might not necessarily agree or believe what you read, just doing it once a day has such a positive effect on your emotional state. Calling a friend, that one never fails. I think it's always good to have someone that you can just call a shoulder that you can cry on and express how you are feeling. Sometimes channeling emotions through hobbies really works. Um, coloring therapy or cooking or playing music has an effect on your emotional state. Spiritual self-care. And spiritual self-care doesn't have to be religious in nature. Sometimes just Having a connection to nature is sufficient for spiritual self-care. 
So there's no right way or wrong way to practice spiritual self-care. It's really all about what makes you feel more connected and balanced. Um, so if you're at home, you could consider keeping a gratitude journal. You could just reflect on yourself and your life, where you are and where you want to be. If you are religious, joining a church group is a great way to practice spiritual self-care. Sometimes just decluttering your home, doing a good spring clean just helps to improve your spirituality. Unplugging from social media, whether it's television, tablet, the cell phone, just for a day is a great way to practice spiritual self-care. <clears throat> At work, you always can have little two-minute break and just go and do some deep breathing exercises. So just focus on breathing in and breathing out. You could go near a window if you can't go outside just to appreciate nature for a short break. And there are also these other fun things to do, such as chair yoga. So even sitting in the tea room on a chair, you can practice stretching your arms. And that is a way to practice spiritual self-care. Social self-care. Humans are social creatures. Connection is so important to us and to nurses. And nurses are natural nurturers. So we need social self-care. And we have to have these meaningful activities or conversations that are going to benefit you or benefit those that are important to you and around you. We can practice social self-care by eating lunch with co-workers. Even at work, we can celebrate each other's birthdays or special events like a baby shower or a bridal shower. We can even talk to the maintenance person, the housekeeper, the secretaries and receptionists, having little conversations about their day or what they are looking forward to is a great boost to social self-care. If you are off duty and you're at home, you can call a loved one. You can go out with a friend, and you can even take your kids on an outing. Personal self-care. So we can participate in our hobbies, such as cooking, baking, sewing, gardening, even treating yourself to your favorite drink, or whether it's a milkshake or a coffee, that is a great way to practice personal self-care because you are paying attention to yourself. What are your own likes and desires? And then you are fulfilling them. If you wa uh, want to get your hair and your nails done, looking after yourself physically is also a way to practice personal self-care. If you enjoy aromatherapy, you could always consider oils or scented candles. Um, creating a vision board for yourself with your life goals and with what you want to achieve is a good way to practice personal self-care. And most importantly, what I like to, to mention to my students is that when you've clocked out of work, make sure that you are truly clocked out. You have to mentally clock out as well. It's pointless having a day off and you're thinking about work and you're thinking about that patient that you nursed or you want to phone the hospital and follow up. How are they doing? Okay, when we clock out of work, we have to mentally clock out and emotionally clock out as well. Our days off are an opportunity for us to be who we are, cultivate an identity outside of being a nurse. This can also help you feel more fulfilled and give you a break from your career. And lastly, we can touch on medical self-care. So all that medical advice that you give your patients, you have to give yourself as well. Medical self-care can include um, focusing on healthy food and drink choices, looking at weight management, know your own numbers. When last did you have your blood pressure, cholesterol and glucose levels checked? 
making sure you get good quality sleep has incredible benefits for your health. And if you did happen to pick up bad coping mechanisms, it's a good time to stop those bad coping mechanisms or stop smoking um, and, and uh, drinking or any other bad habits that might have developed. Okay, so there's lots of opportunities to practice self-care in various ways, in various aspects of our life. I hope that from this list of, of emotional, mental, uh, personal, social, spiritual self-care, you've been able to pick up one or two that going forward, you are going to find ways in your daily work life to include. Even if it's going into the medication cupboard to fetch the, the antibiotic that you're going to administer, just take a few moments to take a few deep breaths in and, and centralize and focus yourselves. Okay, so thank you everybody for your time and for listening. Uh, you're welcome to ask any questions, share any experiences or make any comments. I'm happy to hear from you. If I may read some of the comments in the chat box. Okay, uh, let me see if I can open up the chats. Here we go. Yeah. Uh, so, um, uh, Margaret says, I'm learning a lot. Thank you. Uh, Kennel Patient says, very insightful. I'm enjoying the, the session. Thank you very much. Ifua says, great presentation. Susan says, very refreshing. Uh, Not the confidence says, I'm so thankful for this wonderful session. I've learned a lot. God bless you. Uh, Freya says, awesome. Thank you. Susanna says, thank you. Uh, Rhoda says, great presentation and very, very helpful. That is indeed a great presentation. Thank you, everybody, for the kind words. Um, sometimes it's things that we've heard before, but we just need reminding. Yeah. Right. Thank you very much, Tracy, for this wonderful presentation. I believe we all can actually uh, put ourselves in this position and, and attest to the fact that this is really speaking to us. And indeed, we need to find time to also take care of ourselves. We need to find time to do our nails, to clutter our wardrobes, to do our hair, to wear our favorite dresses, to even dress fancy to work sometime. This is all things we need to do to really up our minds. So thank you very much for this wonderful presentation. Uh, we we'll look you. forward to next month's presentation, which will be announced. Thank you all for joining. And those of us in Ghana, enjoy your holidays. And those of us around the rest of Africa, have a wonderful day. Thank you very much. Thank you, next month. Thank you, cinema. Thank you, cinema. Thank you, too, Brahma. Thanks, 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 Achi. Bye, bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you very much.